Okay, good afternoon, everyone, once again. We'll be starting uh, today's webinar. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sagazal, uh, today's guest speaker. We also have um, Dr. Tadari and Dr. Simon, and uh, myself will be hosting the webinar today. I'm Dr. Khaled. So before we pass on the webinar, I'll be giving a brief introduction about the uh, and what we do. Then after that, uh, Dr. Zagazza will be commencing with his presentation. If you have any questions, please make sure to put them down in the Q&A section. Uh, they will be uh, discussed on at the end of the presentation. So what is it in our game, what we do? So it in our is a volunteer uh, network digitized platform. Uh, it is registered in the United States of America and as of now, it has 70 active volunteer members and it's active across five different uh, countries. Still counting up. So our health promotion, community engagement, mentorship and skills sharing, and finally, medical education. So today's webinar is part of the continuous medical education uh, work uh, we do. We prepare uh, different webinars on important uh, topics. So it is also uh, more than a digital platform because our volunteers participate in different uh, community engagement uh, programs, uh, volunteering and helping out uh, those in need. Mission. Uh, which was a successful event. So the other aspect of it and uh, work is uh, active involvement in health promotion. So there is the Etenal Roja Health Article Writing Competition in collaboration with the Ethiopia Medical Students uh, Association. So we prepare this competition so that young um, medical professionals, young students, medical students have the chance to contribute to the uh, health awareness creation. Uh, so, for example, in the third round of health, uh, health article writing competition, um, the, there were um, two health article writing competition winners, and uh, these were the winners, and they had the chance to uh, visit uh, Global Health AQT University uh, located in Guanta. So the other is the Al Roja Research Fellowship in collaboration with Roja. Uh, it was started on March 14th, and in, also in collaboration with Addis Ababa University uh, Medical Faculty. It uh, includes three departments, uh, namely oncology, radiology, and internal medicine. So there will be uh, competition, then there will be uh, research grant winners and mentorship opportunity for 10 years. So in the fellowship, um, the research grant was given for four uh, winners. These are uh, the winners. So it all beyond uh, the research, the health promotion and community engagement, the main, as you all, uh, might know, it is freely accessible and um, to our education webinars on uh, important uh, healthcare topics with uh, experts. So, so in the year 2024, we have five continuous medical education webinars uh, so far. You can find our past uh, webinars on uh, our YouTube channel, they're all uploaded and you can uh, visit the YouTube channel as well. And way to get updates about our upcoming series, so you can join it in our Telegram channel for healthcare professionals uh, channel. So the link will be sent in the link. You find the link tree for our social media platforms. So by joining this, you can find uh, constant updates on our activities. So for best experience in this webinar, as I said earlier, please send your questions on the Q and A section. And at the end of the webinar, you'll have a chance to ask the speaker directly if you raise your hand. So a few number of participants might be granted this chance by our costs. So to get the CU certificates, the attendees must fulfill the following set of criteria. Please make sure you do these things to get your certificates. So the first one is attend the whole session virtually because we'll be checking the units attended using the Zoom report. The second one is filling the Google form for personal details and attendance. And finally, I get 50% off. 
or more on the post webinar please so after doing this the certificate should be sent to you one to two weeks um, after the webinar so we ask you to wait for us patiently uh, this is it thank you so without further ado i will be uh, introducing today's uh, guest speaker we have the honor of having dr sagazab laka with us uh, dr Sagaz at the Saba university uh, he joined the department of surgery as a lecturer and continued his postgraduate training uh, in neurosurgery he completed his five year of neurosurgery residency at Addis Ababa uh, University College of Health Sciences. Dr. Zagaza has research activities with special interests in neurotrauma, neural tube defects, and neuro-oncology. He is an instrumental member of the Ethiopian Society of Neurosurgical, Neurosurgical Society and current president as well. He is also the co-chair of the Global Neurosurgery Committee. So without further ado, I'll be leaving the stage for Dr. Sagaza. You can continue, Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kali, for the kind introduction. So um, I would like to thank the uh, team at the ATNAO for this periodical educative session. And I'd like also to thank you for uh, the invitation to present on today's topic, which is approach to traumatic brain injury. So now I'll share my screen. Okay, <laughs> so uh, so today I'll be uh, presenting to you uh, about approach to traumatic brain injury. So this is a common condition, especially at the emergency uh, department. Uh, so this, uh, I will uh, first start to talk about the epidemiology of uh, traumatic brain injuries and then proceed with the causes of traumatic brain injuries and we should know about also the classifications of uh, traumatic brain injuries and uh, different, the difference between TBIs and head injuries and then I will uh, discuss on the approach to traumatic brain injuries and then we finalize uh, our discussion with the, with the treatment modalities for traumatic brain injuries. <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, to start with, what we uh, what's assumed, especially in Africa and Ethiopia, is that uh, infectious diseases are uh, more common, and much attention is given to uh, infectious diseases such as uh, HIV, AIDS, HIV, uh, TB, and malaria. But actually, injuries cause more uh, deaths than uh, uh, other, like uh, the three commonest infectious diseases combined. So we should really know about how to manage injuries. It's said that traumatic brain injury is a silent epidemic. Uh, one reason is that the true incidence is not known. Uh, usually the milder forms of traumatic brain injury cases are not, are not registered or usually they don't really come to our uh, OPDs. And then the other is the severe traumatic brain injuries usually die before uh, presenting to the hospital. So this tells us that the pre-hospital care is uh, suboptimal. So uh, many patients usually die uh, before getting registered to the, to the hospitals. And this causes under uh, <coughs> uh, the, the lower registration of uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries. We usually uh, use the name head injuries and traumatic brain injuries alternatively, but there is a slight difference between the two. Head injury uh, signifies all injuries starting from the skull, and it also includes the skull, while traumatic brain injuries more or less uh, usually uh, address um, and is defined primarily as a, an injury, as a head injury, which uh, involves the, uh, the brain parenchyma and other uh, related uh, uh, components of the intracranial space. More than 10 million people sustain traumatic brain injuries uh, every year, and uh, it's estimated that in uh, low and middle income countries as ours, it's three times uh, more common uh, to sustain traumatic brain injuries compared to high income countries. And there is also very few studies that uh, recorded or documented uh, treatment outcomes and also the true incidence of uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries. <clears throat> so coming to, to our country's uh, uh, studies, 
uh, it's shown that uh, TBI is the leading cause of injury-related mortality in Ethiopia, and this is a hospital-based study. And also from a uh, neurosurgical point of view, the uh, surgeries for traumatic brain injuries is uh, the leading uh, surgical indication in, uh, the, uh, in our department. Uh, around 20% of all trauma patients also uh, sustain uh, traumatic brain injuries. So this, this picture, as you can see on the right side, uh, is taken uh, around Piazza uh, early in the morning. And this uh, is a collision between two, ca two, two cars. And you can see that the blood is flowing and people are trying to, to help those injured in the car by dragging them through the windows and also uh, helping, uh, trying to help them. So when we see that, like you, most of you have uh, probably seen uh, road traffic accidents while uh, uh, driving uh, through the roads of uh, the cities. So road traffic accidents are very common and treat treating traumatic brain injuries really, or uh, injuries as a whole, uh, start uh, from uh, the scene of the accident. So most of us should know how to handle the uh, injured patients at the scene of the accident. And sometimes uh, we assume that we are helping patients, but we are uh, actually causing uh, more damage. And then the other commonest cause of uh, injuries and traumatic brain injuries is fall accidents. Uh, usually older age groups uh, fall from a standing height and other uh, younger age group usually fall from uh, 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 a height or uh, at, a, at a farm and so on. So we see many patients who are falling from uh, uh, different types of uh, heights in the emergency department. And the other, the actually, assaults is also uh, very common. Actually, it's, it's shown that one of the common surgical indications for traumatic brain injuries is uh, assaults. To treat properly patients with head injury, we just have to know the anatomy and uh, physiology because uh, the treatment is all related with uh, a good understanding of the anatomy of the brain and then the intracranial space and also relating your anatomy with, the, with your physiology. So we can say that the head is like a walnut. This is a good example. And uh, usually the walnut has a hard shell, but when you open crap, uh, crack it open, you find uh, good stuff inside. So this is uh, really important because the hard shell is really not expandable and the anatomy and physiology is quite related with the, uh, the physiology is quite related with the anatomy. So we have a rigid skull and the rigid skull has uh, uh, components inside. The intracranial space is occupied by the blood, the brain, and then the CSA. Uh, the intracranial space is maintained constant by different physiological uh, mechanisms that we call autoregulatory mechanisms. And this autoregulatory mechanism is usually uh, 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 achieved by uh, adjusting the vasomotor tone. So the blood vessels in the brain really respond to changes in the blood pressure of the patient, primarily the systolic blood pressure, and also the blood vessels usually respond to the chemicals that are found in the, in the blood, primarily the carbon dioxide and the, the oxygen level of the, the blood. So whenever there is a high oxygen, uh, the, uh, the, the impact on the blood vessels is to vasoconstrict them. And whenever there is a higher uh, level of carbon dioxide, that uh, produces vasodilation. So, we manage these things when it comes to uh, uh, reducing the intracranial pr uh, pressure. So whenever there is an injury to the brain, this autoregulatory mechanism uh, is usually uh, disrupted. So what happens when there is an acute increase uh, uh, in mass in the brain? Whenever there is an intracranial space occupying lesion, uh, there are things that uh, happen. So usually the body, uh, tries to, to, to maintain a constant environment, intracranial environment, so it tries to compensate initially. So this happens by constricting the venous uh, uh, system, 
and also displacing the, cere the cerebrospinal fluid uh, to the spinal canal. But as uh, anything, this uh, compensatory mechanism eventually uh, fails and the blood flow to the brain is reduced, which is really uh, devastating to the brain, leading to uh, ischemic incidents. <clears throat> This is very well explained by the monroe kelly doctrine. So as I say, the skull is not expandable except in neonates. Uh, so in the skull, in the intracranial compartment, we have the venous and the, the arterial volume with together with the brain and then the CSF. So whenever there is a, a hemorrhage or any other thing in the, in the intracranial compartment, it displaces first the uh, venous volume uh, will be compromised and then the CSF uh, and then the, the compensation mechanism works like that, but whenever there is uh, expanding mass uh, or hemorrhage, uh, there will be a, a, a dramatic uh, push or uh, a pressure to the brain and the uh, uh, blood flow uh, will then be compromised. <clears throat> so this is a volume pressure uh, curve. So uh, we have a so the, the intracranial compartment, as much as possible, try, is, is maintained constant uh, up, to, up, to, up to certain extent. And then the ICP will be maintained uh, uh, normal. But uh, there is a, a point of decompensation because there, 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 there might not be a compliance whenever there is an expansion uh, of hemorrhage or any other uh, mass in the intracranial compartment. So, we have a steep uh, <coughs> rise in the ICP after the point of decompensation, and then we'll have a, a, a brain herniation. So as you can see, uh, there are different uh, types of brain herniations, but the commonest one is the, the ankle herniation. So whenever uh, we see patients, usually there are clinical signs that are related with uh, ankle herniation that we will see in the next few slides. Uh, the intracranial pressure is maintained normal, and then the normal is usually 10 millimeters of mercury. And then, if it is above 20 millimeters of mercury, it's, uh, it's abnormal, but it can go as high as uh, more than 40 millimeters of uh, mercury, which is a really uh, severe uh, increase in intracranial uh, pressure. <clears throat> The body tries to compensate for the uh, increased ICP and to maintain the cerebral blood flow constant so that it uh, avoids uh, ischemic insult to the brain. So as you see, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is the uh, difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. So whenever there is an increased ICP, usually the body tries to uh, uh, increase the blood pressure that we call the pushing response so that the, the CPP will be maintained uh, uh, constant and then the, there will be a constant cerebral uh, blood flow. <clears throat> but uh, we also have other other clinical uh, presentations which we call Cushing's trial that uh, includes bradycardia, high blood pressure and uh, irregularities in the uh, respiratory pipe. Uh, parameters of the patient. But uh, in moderate or severe head injuries, autoregulation is usually is, um, quite often impaired and uh, the brain will be more uh, vulnerable. So any kind of hypotension uh, might lead to secondary uh, brain injury. So uh, clinically, we uh, should uh, see, uh, we usually see patients and then we classify patients according to the mechanism of injury, according to the severity uh, and other parameters. So according to the uh, mechanism of injury, we have a blunt head injury, which includes like uh, accidents, like uh, road uh, traffic uh, injuries, and then uh, falls from height. And also we have a, a, a penetrating head injuries, like gunshot wounds and missile uh, injuries. We also classify uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries according to the, their severity. So uh, Glasgow Coma Scale is the most widely used uh, 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 classifying mechanism for traumatic brain injuries. Uh, 
before that, we uh, usually have uh, subjective uh, severity um, uh, classifications like we uh, used to have other terms like uh, comatous, uh, obtunded, lethargic, and other 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 wordings for uh, uh, to explain to colleagues and so on. But all those terms uh, were very subjective, and it doesn't really tell, and it doesn't really uh, help us with the serial follow-up of a uh, uh, traumatic brain injury patient. So the Glasgow Coma Scale is uh, most like the most objective parameters that we can use, and it's scored. Uh, out of 15, we have uh, it has three components. We have the best eye response, the best verbal response, and then the best motor response. So it's very uh, important to measure the Glasgow Coma Scale of uh, patients whenever a patient presents to to the emergency. So according to the uh, Glasgow Coma Scale and other parameters, we have. Uh, uh, a mild TBI, a moderate, and a severe TBI. So, uh, if a patient has fourteen or fifteen GCS, uh, we 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 diagnose a mild traumatic brain injury, and the amnesia is usually transient. And these patients, like mild traumatic brain injury patients, have a really brief loss of consciousness, which is usually uh, less than uh, which usually lasts for less than five minutes. But whenever patients uh, have a GCS of uh, between 9 and 13, or a loss of consciousness of more than five minutes, uh, those patients are, uh, are moderate TBI patients. And then severe TBI patients are those uh, who, who, has, who have a GCS of less than nine. So among these uh, severity classes, the mild TBIs are really common, uh, fortunately, and then the severe TBIs are uh, usually less common. And uh, this might be, uh, it might be also due to uh, uh, unknown incidence of this uh, severe uh, uh, TBI patients, but usually from our studies, 15% of TBI patients uh, from the emergency department are uh, severe uh, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, GCS is said to be a unidirectional uh, severity classification method, so uh, it might be affected by conditions like uh, sedation intake, uh, illicit drug use, or alcohol intake. So, and also extracranial injuries also might might affect uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale of the patients. Whenever we try to assess patients, usually. Uh, the, the reliable GCS is post resuscitation. So, if a patient has a um, has hypotension or hypoxic, in the low GCS, we cannot consider that as a reliable GCS. So, usually, we have to measure Glasgow Coma Scale after correcting uh, <coughs> conditions like hypotension, um, um, hypoxia, and uh, other other conditions. So among the mild traumatic uh, brain injury uh, patients, concussion is the, the, the most common uh, condition. Uh, usually people uh, uh, misunderstand concussion is a mild, uh, usually use concussion as a mild traumatic brain injury, but concussion is a subset of a mild TBI. So usually uh, concussion uh, patients with concussion have no strategy. Uh, Structural abnormality. So, if you if you sub if you subject the patient to concussion or for a CT scan, uh, you might not see anything on the CT scan. But patients usually uh, complain of headache and other other uh, symptoms. Uh, so, clinical clinically, patients with a concussion uh, present with disorientation or confusion uh, immediately after trauma. Uh, and patients might also have impaired balance within a day of uh, injury. They might also have a slower uh, reaction time, uh, and they might also have difficulty to articulate, and also uh, might complain of uh, their uh, memory memory uh, disturbance. <clears throat> the other uh, common uh, type of head injury is uh, fractures. So uh, actually, in our Setting fractures are really common because assaults are uh, relatively common, uh, and usually the 
mechanism of assault is stick injuries. Uh, so usually we see skull vault fractures. Skull vault fractures can be closed or open, as you might see on the on the picture. Closed skull vault fractures do not have any related uh, uh, overlaying wound associated with the fracture, but open skull vault fractures usually have an open wound uh, overlaying uh, uh, the, the, the fracture. <clears throat> so the fracture by itself can be a linear. So the linear is an, un an undisplaced uh, uh, skull vault fracture, and it might also be a depressed skull vault fracture where the outer table of the skull uh, goes uh, underneath the uh, the outer, uh, the adjacent outer tables, and if it is a significant depressed skull vault fracture, the outer table might even, uh, as you might see from from this picture, the outer table might even go underneath the inner table of the adjacent normal uh, bone. So we call it a depressed skull vault uh, fracture. And this one on the right side is uh, significant. <clears throat> Basal skull fractures are uh, um, fracture types usually involving the skull base and patients uh, usually present with uh, bleeding or CSF leak uh, from the ears or nostrils. Uh, patients might also have a periorbital ecchymosis and we can also have a chemosis retro uh, auricular uh, ecchymosis which we call battle sign and if patients also have a temporal bone fracture specifically around the petrous bone and then the mastoidal sinuses uh, patients might uh, have cranial nerve defects like a uh, fascial nerve palsy and uh, ampersand nerve uh, palsy and some patients might also have hemotympanum uh, due to uh, uh, blood conviction behind uh, the uh, uh, behind the external uh, auditory myelitis, <laughs> tympanic membrane. And the other uh, traumatic brain injury types are bleedings, intracranial bleeding. So we have a uh, subdural hematoma. Uh, so subdural uh, hematomas usually, uh, they are bleedings just uh, under the, uh, the, the dura. And we also have epidural hematoma. So it's outside the dura in between the the skull and then the dura. And we also have a subarachinoid hemorrhage that follows the sulci of the brain. Uh, and we also uh, can have intraventricular hemorrhage usually inside the ventricular compartment of the brain. <clears throat> and also we have uh, intracerebral uh, hemorrhage. Uh, so when we say intracerebral hemorrhage, the uh, bleeding is usually, uh, the size of the bleeding is usually um, more than one centimeter, but uh, if the bleeding is less than one centimeter on a CT scan, we uh, diagnose intracerebral uh, contusions. And in, in the other, the, when we come to subdural hematoma, this is relatively common. Uh, so uh, subdural hematomas uh, are usually <coughs> categorized as acute, subacute, and chronic. So the bleeding source in subdural hematomas are usually uh, bridging veins. So the, the most severe uh, type of subdural hematoma is the acute one because usually patients with, uh, present with a, a mechanism of injury that's, uh, that's, that, 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 was a, uh, that was a high impact. So usually uh, on a CT scan, uh, the, the subdural hematoma uh, presents with a hyperdense lesion, which is con uh, concave towards the brain. So this is usually an acute bleeding, a subdural bleeding within three days of injury. So it looks hyperdense. And we also have a subacute subdural hematoma. Uh, when the blood starts to hemolyze, it it uh, it will be a uh, uh, isodense. So it more or less looks it more or less looks like uh, the brain uh, parenchyma. And then we have if it is more hypodense, uh, it gets more hypodense usually at, after three weeks. So it, it, it that one is a, a chronic uh, uh, subdural hematoma. <clears throat> 
And then the other uh, intracranial bleeding is epidural hematoma, as you can see uh, on the uh, right side. <clears throat> this is the draw of a the, this is the dura of a patient, the patient, and then just overlaying the dura, there is this uh, clot uh, pressing on the dura, and then uh, when it presses on the dura, it looks like a, a convex uh, shape. So this is, uh, this looks hyperdense, and at the same time, it looks hypodense. So whenever you see a CT scan, you should uh, differentiate between a subdural hematoma and uh, acute uh, epidural hematoma uh, based on their appearances. <clears throat> we also have intracerebral contusion. So, uh, intracerebral. So, this is this this. These are multiple contusions on the front on the frontal lobe of a patient. So, these are uh, uh, if measured, they are less than one centimeter. So, we call them intracerebral uh, contusions. So, these are small small bleedings in the brain and then we have the larger relatively larger bleedings in the brain uh, which we call uh, intracerebral hemorrhages on this uh, ct scan you can see that there is a hyperdense uh, temporal uh, <coughs> a lesion which uh, is uh, intracerebral uh, hemorrhage the other is intraventricular hemorrhage so these are uh, hemorrhages in the ventricular system. And usually isolated intraventricular hemorrhages due to trauma might not be uh, common. Usually they are associated with intracerebral uh, hemorrhages that uh, extended to, to, to the ventricular system. So when we come to managing a TBI patient, so you should all you should relate uh, your knowledge on to like you should translate your knowledge to to the management of a traumatic brain injury patient. So any injured patient should uh, should be treated according to the ATLS guideline. So A, B, C, D. So airway uh, is the most important thing, and <clears throat> it's. Uh, uh, so whenever we think of uh, managing the airway, we should also immobilize the cervical spine. So that's that's very that's very important. And then the other is uh, breathing. Uh, so we should supplement patients with oxygen, uh, and we should also maintain a, a normal volumia. And then after, like uh, we manage all these life-threatening conditions which kill the patient within a few minutes, we should really assess the neurology, the neurology of uh, these patients. Uh, <clears throat> so neurological assessment, you should, it, it doesn't have to be from, uh, it doesn't have to be very uh, detailed neurologic assessment. So uh, our neurologic assessment is targeted towards uh, uh, diagnosing uh, uh, intra, like diagnosing uh, if there is any increased ICP uh, and also localizing where the uh, hemorrhage is and so on. So, and then most importantly, also to classify patients according to their, their severity. So, the most important uh, evaluations that help us towards these goals are Glasgow Coma Scale is the first one. And then we should also assess the pupillary reaction in size. So we have to compare both sides for symmetry and also for uh, light, uh, uh, for the pupillary uh, light reflex. So if one uh, side is dilated, that means there is uh, bleeding, if it is a trauma, uh, bleeding on, on that side. And you, we, that, that we call a later, lateralizing sign. And then we also should assess the motor examination of the uh, patient. So we should really see whether there is a, a motor deficit or not. So patients might have a motor deficit on the on one side. So usually patients, if they have a motor deficit on one side, it means like there is a, <clears throat> a lesion on the contralateral side. So these are lateralizing signs. And then we also uh, should really see sensory, we should evaluate for sensory deficit, usually commonly uh, sensory deficit. And then uh, we also have to ask for a presence of a seizure. <clears throat>
Once we optimize the patient, we once we stabilize the patient, uh, uh, patient, and then uh, treat uh, the life-threatening conditions, we have to uh, send baseline investigations because these patients might might uh, what might go to the, to the OR. So we have to at least have a CBC uh, hematocrit blood group and cross match, and a diagnostic imaging modalities should be sent. So. One thing uh, to consider is all patients with a severe head injury or a severe head injury should be a, uh, should be suspected of having a C-spine uh, injury. So uh, we should also order a C-spine CT uh, together with the uh, brain uh, CT. <clears throat> So the, the golden standard for initial imaging modality uh, is a CT scan. So whenever a patient comes, and if you are going to send a, an imaging modality, CT scan is the first one to, to send. Uh, one thing is it's highly sensitive to bleeding, uh, intracranial bleedings, and it also delineates the bone, uh, the bone structure of the skull uh, very well, and uh, it takes. Uh, like less than five minutes to have a diagnosis uh, on a CT scan, and uh, there is no actually uh, absolute contraindications for a CT scan. Usually, specifically, we order a non contrast CT scan so that there is no contraindication for that. And it's also less, less expensive compared to MRI and better uh, availability in our cities. We have two windows. We should see two windows on a trauma brain CT, a brain window and a bone window. So the brain window uh, shows at, uh, any intracranial bleedings, and then the bone window shows as uh, uh, fractures. Uh, uh, bony, uh, the bony uh, structure will be very well outlined. <clears throat> what about MRI? We, we, uh, Quite often, see uh, MRI imaging uh, for a, a trauma patient. So this is not really um, uh, good to send because usually the diagnostic capacity for hemorrhage is less, uh, and it's really expensive, and it takes uh, up to thirty to forty-five minutes uh, to take a MRI. So for an agitated patient, it's really difficult to subject these patients in the MRI. Uh, machine for so long. So when do, when do we consider when, when do we really consider the question is when do we really consider uh, MRI? Uh, usually MRI is reserved for a follow-up imaging modality. And uh, usually if we do not see any bleeding on a, on a CT scan, so there are uh, sequences, MR sequences that might uh, help us to, to see very petechial uh, hemorrhage, especially for diffuse axonal injury. Uh, patients, uh, those that might be uh, helpful, but like as the first uh, line imaging modality, it, it's it's not recommended to have an MRI. <clears throat> Usually, we, so we have to balance uh, overutilization of uh, CTs by uh, because we have uh, mild, uh, many uh, mild traumatic brain injury patients. And uh, the easiest thing that we, uh, our tendency is to send all patients for a CT. But overutilization of CT is not good because one thing is radiation exposure and then the other is it, it's cold. So over the years, there is a higher tendency of uh, sending a CT scan. So to, to avoid that uh, we, to, and to make uh, things simpler, we should use guidelines. So, for which patients are we going to uh, <clears throat> are we going to send a CT scan uh, in mild TBI uh, patients? So, we have a guideline. the The most common guideline used is the Canadian uh, uh, head uh, CT rule. So, this this uh, guideline uh, is hundred percent sensitive. So, it picks any abnormalities that are hundred sensitive. 100%. <clears throat> so, uh, high risk patients, uh, mild TBI patients that are called, that are defined as high risk are those patients who uh, have a GCS score of less than <clears throat> 50 after two hours uh, of injury. 
And uh, if we suspect open or depressed scan fracture, we should send them uh, to a CT scan, regardless of their, their GCS and any signs of basal scan fracture. And if they are having persistent vomiting, so those patients should also be uh, sent to a, a CT. And then the other is <clears throat> those patients who are uh, older than 65 years should also be sent to a CT scan. So uh, medium risk uh, patients are those who uh, have amnesia before impact for uh, who have anti-grade uh, amnesia for uh, more than 30 minutes and who gave a dangerous mechanism of injury on the in, on their history. Let's say a patient comes uh, from a from a road traffic accident where uh, all uh, the passengers are dead, but uh, he he is the only survivor. And so this 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 uh, patient should be sent to to a CT scan because it's a dangerous mechanism of injury. <clears throat> so we have also a guideline for uh, pediatrics uh, patients. Uh, so for those who are younger than two years, uh, CT should be sent if the GCS is less than uh, 15. And if they are having a palpable skull fracture, or if they uh, have, if they are agitated or sleepy, or their response time is very slow, uh, so these patients are like categorized as a high risk. So this patient should be uh, sent to a CT scan. <laughs> so if they don't have all these all these parameters, but are having scalp hematoma or uh, a loss of consciousness for more than five seconds and not uh, acting. So if they uh, also parents give a, a, a history of behavior and change after injury and also severe mechanism of injury. So this, this patient should uh, really uh, be discussed with the parents or the guardians. And then uh, after discussion, they might also be sent uh, for a CT scan. And uh, for those two years and older, uh, similarly, a GCS of less than 50, and uh, those patients with signs of basal skull fracture who are agitated, uh, sleepy, and also uh, other behavioral changes, those, those patients should be sent to for a CT. Uh, and if they don't have this, uh, if their GCS is quite okay, and no signs of basal skull fracture, but uh, who presented with persistent vomiting, loss of consciousness, severe headache, and severe mechanism of injury, they, they should also be uh, sent to a CT scan uh, upon discussions of the parents. So once we diagnose a, <clears throat> a head injury, and uh, once we also identified uh, uh, signs of increased ICP, we should right away uh, start treating these patients. So the treatment, uh, some of the treatments are very, very simple and we can act quickly at the emergency level because the first thing that we can do is position the, the shoulders and, the upper, and then the, the upper torso of the patient by elevating the head of the bed 30 degrees and keeping the head midline. So this helps, this facilitates a venous return and also uh, keeping the head midline prevents kinking of the uh, jugular vein. And then the other is treating pain. So we uh, give a light sedation for this patient. So, so studies show that uh, pain uh, cause increased intracranial pressure. So we should really treat uh, uh, pain with light sedation. And the other thing is to, uh, to also prevent secondary brain injury. So the causes for secondary brain injuries include <clears throat> hypotension. We should really avoid hypotension and we should maintain a systolic blood pressure that's uh, more than 90 millimeters of uh, mercury. So we should resuscitate these patients, also compensate, uh, uh, replace the, the fluid loss. Uh, and then the other is uh, uh, prevent hyperglycemia. So Hyperglycemia is also a, a cause for uh, disrupting the autoregulatory mechanism, and that should really be uh, avoided. And for those patients who are uh, uh, severe TBI patients, we should really consider intubation as soon as possible. And then the other is we should also treat uh, infection 
and avoid hyperthermia if the cause is uh, infection. So this um, inf uh, hyperthermia is really, uh, it, it, it puts patients in a hypercatabolic state. So uh, we should uh, treat uh, hy uh, hyperglycemia, sorry, and then also hyper hyperthermia. And uh, the other is osmotic therapy. Uh, osmotic therapy, usually we use manitol. So manitol is commonly used in our, in, in our hospitals. So it's an uh, osmotic uh, diuretic. Uh, once we diagnose that there is an increased ICP, so we temporarily this patient, we temporarily treat this uh, patient with manitol. It's not a definitive treatment, but uh, it's, a, it's a temporizing measure just before <coughs> we uh, take uh, the patient until we take the patient to the to the operating room. We can uh, start uh, start him or her uh, with manitol, and then the, the other alternative is hypertonic uh, saline. <clears throat> but if we don't have money, sometimes we uh, do not get manitol in the pharmacies. So if there is no manitol, uh, we can. If there is no manitol and actually hypertonic saline, we can also give. Uh, uh, Lasix for uh, these patients. But one thing to be uh, uh, careful is uh, when we decide to give manitol, we should also consider the contraindications. Uh, so if a patient is in uh, in shock, we don't have to give manitol because uh, manitol depletes the intravascular volume and it uh, uh, facilitates it worsens. Uh, uh, the shock, the hypovolemic shock, and if the patient, if patients also have, have renal failure, so that's also a contraindication of giving uh, uh, manitol. And also, if a patient is in a, uh, if the serum uh, osmolarity is uh, high, we don't have to give manitol. And once we start to giving manitol, we should really follow this patient. So we should catheterize these patients and. We should follow their uh, urine acid. And then the other uh, <laughs> treatment is hyperventilation. So when we discuss on the physiology, uh, one of the things is uh, maintaining a vas the vasomotor tone and uh, uh, so the carbon dioxide level in the blood and also uh, the oxygen level really uh, changes the blood vessels. Di di the the blood vessel diameter of the uh, in the blood vessel diameter in the brain. So uh, when we decrease the carbon dioxide level, there will be a and increase the oxygen level. There will be a, a vasoconstriction, which really limits, uh, which really helps to decrease the ICP. But we do not usually use a hyperventilation uh, as a prophylactic uh, as a prophylactic measure. So it's it's a treatment and it should it shouldn't be. Uh, for long because it can also be a risk for uh, hypoxia. And the definitive uh, treatment is surgery, especially if patients are having intracranial uh, hemorrhage. So acute epidural hematoma is the, it's, it's commonly uh, uh, it's a common condition uh, after uh, traumatic brain injuries. So we do a, a craniotomy for uh, for acute epidural hematoma. So the indication to do a surgery is if the patient has an isochoria uh, with pupillary asymmetry, and if the uh, thickness of the hematoma is uh, more than one point five. Sorry, this is uh, centimeters. And then if there is a midline shift of more than five millimeters, and uh, if we measure the volume and if it is more than 30 cc, uh, so those patients should be uh, should be subjected to uh, the craniotomy. The other is acute subdural hematoma. So this is one of the most severe uh, traumatic brain injuries. So usually patients might have also related brain swelling uh, together with the acute subdural hematoma. Uh, usually, this needs a longer surgery and a longer, uh, wider bone flap so that we decompress, so that we can evacuate the clot. As you can see, there is the clot, and then, then this is the dry, and then this is the bone opening, which is usually should be uh, 30, um, 30 centimeters wide, so that we have a good uh, 
space for the brain to uh, to uh, to relax and uh, the indications are thickness more than 10 millimeters or uh, midline shift of uh, midline shift of uh, more than five milli uh, millimeters and if we are following a patient with uh, acute cerebral hematoma we have to uh, measure the GCS serial measurement of the GCS and if there is a GCS drop by two or more, these patients should really be considered for a, a surgery. And if there is an isoporia, so on this patient, uh, this is usually we, uh, this is the right side acute subdural hematoma. So this patient uh, is expected to to to, uh, to have a, a right sided uh, dilated people. So if there is an isoporia, that's a localizing. Uh, um, uh, clinical uh, uh, clinical finding, and if the if there is an ICP more than twenty millimeters of mercury, so all these things are uh, surgical indications uh, in acute subdural hematoma patient. <clears throat> the other common uh, surgical condition is chronic subdural hematoma. Usually, this is uh, it's con it's considered usually uh, these patients are older patients. Uh, so the bleeding source is a bridging vein. So when there is an atrophied brain in old uh, uh, patients, the, the bridging veins are torn easily. So any trivial impact to the head might cause uh, chronic subdural hematoma. So these patients usually have a progressive headache and other neurologic deficits, and uh, their <laughs> clinical presentation might be uh, mistaken with other other conditions, uh, but when we uh, have a CT scan, we you can see that there is a bleeding uh, on one side, which defines as chronic subdural hematoma, and the surgery is usually a uh, uh, burr holes. So these are small holes in the scan, and the hemolyzed blood will uh, readily uh, uh, be evacuated. Uh, usually, it's under pressure and. Uh, you, you, we can irrigate it and then uh, remove the entire hematoma. So a thickness of a hematoma more than 10 millimeters or midline shift of more than 5 millimeters is significant and the hematoma should be evacuated as early as possible. And the other common condition is depressed skull fracture. Uh, so any skull fracture which is compound should be a uh, 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 surgically treated. Uh, the wood should be uh, washed thoroughly and then the fragment bones, if they are uh, infected, they should be removed and uh, and usually the patients might have a uh, <clears throat> might have a dural ear, so that should also be uh, repaired. The other thing is following up uh, these patients. Uh, so once a patient is operated, uh, post-operative follow-up is as important as uh, uh, the surgery and other treatment modalities. So clinical, we have clinical uh, follow-up and uh, imaging follow-up. So we usually rely on a clinical follow-up because most of our patients might not afford for a repeated uh, CT scan. So as long as a patient has a clinical improvement, we can uh, follow them clinically. So Usually in the works, we have a neuroscience chart, which usually, which might be visible on the right side. So we have to monitor their vital signs. We have to mo monitor the, the wound status. Uh, and also uh, we, we should monitor their uh, neurologic status. So that's very important. So any significant drop in the GCS, that's a drop of two or more, uh, uh, should, should warrant a control CT. So thank you very much. This is all. Thank you very much, Dr. Sagaza. That was a very uh, informative session. Uh, you've managed to go over uh, most of the topics that are encountered when approached to a patient with traumatic brain injury. So once again, thank you for that. So thank dear you. participants, if you have any questions, please uh, you can post them directly in the Q&A chat box or in the direct chat box as well. And uh, Dr. Zagaza will uh, address them by the end.
So having said that, we'll directly proceed to the post-CME quiz. So I'll share the link below shortly. So just to reiterate, since uh, some of our attendees are uh, having a bit difficulty, so mm. in order to be certified, you have to be able to attend the entire session. The minutes will be checked via Zoom. So you have to fill in the post-CME quiz link that I'm going to directly paste in the chat box below. And you have to be able to score 50% or more. So if you're able to fulfill all of these uh, requirements, you will have your uh, certificates by your inbox in a matter of one to two weeks. So I've shared the post CME quiz link below. You have 10 minutes to attempt uh, four questions. So having said that, my colleague, Dr. Simon, will proceed with the q and Okay. So... Uh, so far, we have managed to collect around 18 questions. So we'll try to go through the questions quickly. Um, the first question says, any unique manifestations to identify for the specific type of brain herniation other than Cushing's triad? Okay, thank you. It's a good uh, question. Um, actually, um, uh, usually the clinical signs are to, you, we say it's a, they are lateralizing signs, so we don't really uh know where, whether it's an ankle herniation, transtentorial herniation, and ad, like we have many uh, types of herniations. So the clinical findings usually tell us that there is a herniation and increased ICP. Um, so the second oh, question so, reads, okay, so go on, question, uh, Most traumatic brain injury, injury patients undergo surgery. How many patients, how many percent survive? Um, so as I said, it depends on the classes of uh, traumatic brain injuries. So we have the mild ones, the moderate, and then the severe traumatic brain injuries. So the mortality is high uh, in severe traumatic brain injuries. So if a patient comes with a distance of three, so it's like close to 100%. So if a patient comes with 15 the survive the survival rate is like more than ninety percent. So uh, for severe tra traumatic brain injuries, uh, the mortality might be uh, as high as uh, forty to fifty percent. Okay, thank you, doctor. So the third question reads: How common is it to have neuropsychiatric disorders after subdural hematoma evacuation and its management? Okay, that's a. Uh, okay. That's also a good question. It's a uh, chronic, uh, you, we have uh, an acute subdural hematoma, a subacute and chronic subdural hematoma. Um, so one of the differentials for uh, subacute and chronic subdural hematomas might be dementia and other neuropsychiatric disorders. But uh, subdural hematoma by itself doesn't cause a, a neuropsychiatric uh, disorder. Actually, TBI patients overall might have a, uh, Behavioral change, even mild traumatic brain injury patients uh, might have this behavioral change after the trauma, but uh, not like nothing specific for uh, subdural hematoma. Okay, so the first question reads: uh, Nice presentation. What if we what if we don't have a monitor for management of the? I think they're talking about the management for intracranial. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. It's a uh, Usually, if we do not have money to it, we uh, usually use uh, Lasix. So that's what we use. Hypertonic saline is not uh, commonly available. So it's it, usually in our setup, it's not an option. Okay. Um, fifth question says, how do we measure the volume of a he uh, hematoma? We uh, measure the volume. Uh, we measure the uh, the like the actual the actual measurement. We take the actual measurement, the PA measurement, and then the depth of the hematoma. We uh, multiply the the three dimensions, the measurements along the three dimensions, and divide it by two. Um, the sixth question says, how do we manage intracerebral contusion? So it's it's actually, it depends on the patient's presentation. Um, usually if the uh, contusions are not uh, giving the patient uh, 
a neurologic deficit, <clears throat> we usually manage contusions conservatively, but uh, um, if patients are having like frontal contusions with a uh, pressure effect, which is seen on the, on the CT scan, sometimes these patients might uh, need a surgical treatment. Okay. Uh, seventh question says, what are preferred antiseptics in traumatic brain injuries? Uh, antibiotics? Usually in traumatic brain injuries, it's, uh, uh, patients might have aspiration, aspiration pneumonia and other uh, like super infection from the scalp wound and so on. So we treat depending on the the depending the depending on the cause of the infection if the patients are having uh, infection. But uh, one thing that I uh, forgot on the, my presentation is uh, prophylaxis antibiotics for basal skull fractures. So it's uh, usually not uh, recommended to give uh, prophylaxis antibiotics for those patients with basal skull fracture presenting with a CSF leak. Okay. Uh, next question says, how could hypertonic saline be prepared locally as a desperate measure of ICP management? Uh, I do, did not really come across. Uh, we haven't uh, tried to prepare. But one of the things uh, to consider is how sterile it it can be uh, if we uh, really plan to prepare it uh, in the hospitals. But that might be a good option to prepare local to prepare it locally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nice question says: As a lab technologist, are there any tests required other than the CBC and hematocrit? Other than CBC and uh, so this uh, CBC and hematocrit are the baseline uh, investigations. So if we are planning to take the patient uh, to surgery uh, as soon as possible, those are the minimum uh, investigations that we should do. But like based on the patient's history, like drug intake. Uh, so if patients are on blood thinners, we might also. Uh, needs to have the coagulation profile of these patients. If uh, patients uh, have uh, comorbidities, we can also order uh, organ function tests, uh, and it depends. And the other is uh, mild traumatic brain injuries. There are other lab uh, investigations uh, to predict whether those patients might have uh, structural uh, brain lesions. So usually not in our setup, but in other, uh, in Europe and the US, they measure uh, biochemical parameters uh, to determine whether there is a structural damage to the brain or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question reads, what are indications for antibiotics in traumatic brain injury patients? Yeah, that's very important. Uh, <clears throat> not with suspected raised ICP, but uh, for those patients who have basal skull fracture, especially anterior uh, cranial fossa skull base fractures, like ethmoid sphenoid sinus fractures. Insertion of NG tube uh, is contraindicated because there are, there are case reports or cases that uh, in, in which NG tubes were inserted into the intracranial uh, and compartment in the brain. So NG tube insertion is contraindicated in basal skull fractures. Okay. Um, next question reads, what are indications for antibiotics in traumatic brain injury patients? Um, if there is any clear-cut uh, infection, so that's an indication for uh, to, to, for starting antibiotics, but like we don't, we do not have to give uh, antibiotics uh, as a prophylaxis. Uh, 
except for those patients who are going to the operating room. Okay. Um, what are indications for severe prophylaxis and TBI? This was the most asked question in the chat box. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Uh, so seizure prophylaxis, we give seizure prophylaxis uh, usually for moderate and severe traumatic brain injuries uh, and also penetrating traumatic brain injuries. And this is to prevent early onset uh, seizure, not late onset uh, seizure. So if the patient uh, doesn't have any history of uh, seizure from before, we give we start them uh, on uh, phenytoin right after uh, right after their injury, and we uh, give them for seven days. So like commonly we use phenytoin, but uh, lev levitracetam is also uh, uh, used with later because it has less side effects. So, but like we don't have to prolong it after seven days, except for those patients who seized after the injury or who had a, a previous history of seizure. Okay. Um, next question says, what do we mean by when we say GCS is uni unidirectional and what are clinical features of concussion? So that's uh, when we say GCS is uni unidirectional. So we only give numbers uh, when we measure the GCS. So we don't really consider uh, other concomitant factors that might affect the GCS. So whenever we uh, measure the GCS, we should consider the other concomitant factors. So if I say like uh, the GCS is 7 out of 15, in uh, alcohol intoxicated patient. Uh, so for somebody who, whom I am telling or discussing, that means a severe TBI. Actually, we should consider these patients as a severe TBI patients, but we should really add the information alcohol intake. So that's to mean, uh, unidirectional is to mean that it only considers the neurologic response of the patients, but not like, other concomitant factors like alcohol intake, uh, illicit drug use, uh, other uh, causes for low GCS like uh, hypoxia, hypotension, and so on. Okay. Um, is there any duration of time to intervene surgically for epidural or subdural hematoma who come late for intervention? Um, So if, uh, if a patient comes with a epidural or subdural hematoma, and if they if they have a, an indication for surgery, they should be uh, operated right away. So the golden there is this golden hour concept. So if a patient has a uh, usually patients ideally should come within four hours to have a very good uh, post-operative outcome. But in our setup, uh, patients uh, often can come after four hours but uh, once they present to the hospital it's ideally they should be operated as early as possible okay question 15 says what is the place of anti-epileptics in the management of tbi and for how long so since we've yeah. already talked yeah. about the anti-epileptic management we're going to talk about the duration of management yeah, so if a patient, it, if it is a, a prophylaxis, we should give not more than seven days. So it's given for seven days. But if a patient had a, a seizure, post-traumatic seizure, that should be prolonged. So usually the patients, usually at least a minimum of six months should be given. And then this patient should be uh, followed and EEG should be done. Um, after seven, like if they are seizure free for six months, uh, EEG should be done. And if the EEG doesn't really show any uh, findings, we might tucker and discontinue it. Okay. Uh, next question says Is it better to intubate or not if the patient has a GCS score below eight? And 
there is no uh, neurosurgery set up in the area to refer to. Uh, and okay, so it's a good question. But, uh, so if a patient is unconscious, the major uh, objective of uh, intubating this patient is to also secure the airway. Because these patients might uh, have airway obstruction and so on. So, intubation is to secure the airway too. But in the meantime, we can also plan for hyperventilation. And for the aggressive treatment of ICP, uh, we might need a neurosurgery setup. But if patients are not uh, maintaining their airway, they, sh they should be intubated. Okay. Question 17 says, are there any special things in pediatric patients? I have seen some falling accidents with soft tissue swelling, which is large enough that you can't appreciate the underlying bony structures, but they're clinically well. In such cases, is it necessary to have X-ray or CT scan considering our resource limitations? Yeah, so based on the guideline, scalp hematoma is not a... Scalp, hematom, uh, scalp swelling by itself is not a, an indication, but usually patients might have a cephal hematoma or subgallial uh, hematoma that might also cause uh, severe anemia due to bleeding in the scalp. So for those kind of patients, we might also, I prefer to have a CT scan. Okay, so the final question uh, reads, is it possible for subdural hematoma to undergo clot lysis spontaneously if the bleeding has already stopped? Yes, that's what happens uh, with, uh, with chronic subdural hematoma. So it's not like only the bleeding, uh, but the pathophysiology is, if it is acute subdural hematoma, it's torrential bleeding in the subdural space. But, uh, for chronic subdural hematoma, usually small veins uh, are bleeding in the subdural space, and that incites uh, an inflammatory process in the subdural space. So inflammatory exudates also precipitate, uh, also like uh, increase the, the subdural collection. So it's not only the bleeding, but uh, uh, inflammatory response in the subdural space. Um, but clot lysis is the it's it's a process that subsequently happened. Okay, doctor, thank you. Uh, we've uh, finished with the questions from the Q&A and the chat box. Next, uh, we're gonna proceed to the questions from, we're gonna uh, go through the questions uh, uh, that are uh, uh, seen in the CME quiz. So let me just share the, the screen. Um, okay, so um, the first question on the quiz reads, which one is, false for basal skull fractures. A, uh, most CSF leaks stop by themselves. B, prophylaxis antibiotics for any patient with CSF leak should be given. C, most patients are treated conservatively. And D reads intermittent LP and drainage of CSF might be tried for persistent CSF leaks. Uh, Dr. Zagazav, uh, would you uh, explain the question for us, please? Yeah, so... Uh... This one is about all about basal skin fractures, and uh, uh, so it's one of the questions that are asked. Uh, so, like for most CSF leaks, stop by, by themselves. So, uh, this is true. Uh, so, if a patient has a CSF leak, we should admit them and uh, follow follow these patients. But we do not have to give antibiotics unless they uh, develop any kind of infection, which commonly they might develop many jets, but prophylaxis antibiotics is not given for those patients. So yeah, B is the answer. Okay. So a uh, second question reads, which one is an indication for brain CT scan for mild traumatic brain injury patients? A. Uh, a, a traumatic brain injury patient with dangerous mechanism of injury, like ejection from a motor vehicle, pedestrian run over by a motor vehicle, or fall from a height. B, a traumatic brain injury patient with a history of coagulopathy, 
see a traumatic uh, a patient with brief history of loss of consciousness and drug intoxication, and D, all of the above. Dr. Sagaza. Uh, yeah, so um, from the, the slides, any patient with dangerous mechanism of injury should get a CT scan. Uh, and if a patient has a, a history of uh, bleeding tendency or any uh, blood thinner intake, so if they sustain a traumatic brain injury, they are highly likely to have a hem uh, bleeding, intracranial bleeding. So uh, we should also uh, send them for a CT scan. Uh, and also if a patient has a, a brief history of loss of consciousness and drug intoxication. So because the drug intoxication might also affect the mentation of these patients, we should really uh, consider these patients as a, a case of head injury and we should also uh, send them to a CT scan. So all of the above are indications. Okay, thank you, doctor. The third question reads, which one is true about severe traumatic brain injury? All patients with severe traumatic injury should be intubated and put on a mechanical, uh, mechanical ventilator. B reads, all patients with severe traumatic brain injury should be considered as having C-spine injury unless ruled otherwise. C reads, manitol treatment can replace surgery. D uh, reads A and B, and E says all of the above, Dr. Sagaza. Yeah, for this question, the answer is uh, <clears throat> all patients with severe TBI should be intubated. So one uh, one thing is to secure their airway, and then the other is also to assist uh, their breathing. So they should be put also on mechanical ventilator. Uh, and then the other is the commonest uh, concomitant injury uh, in severe traumatic brain injuries is uh, C-spine injury. So any patient who comes with a severe traumatic brain injury should be uh, taught as having C-spine uh, injury and unless ruled otherwise. Uh, so that's also true. And then the other is monitored treatment cannot replace surgery. So uh, we, do, we, do not, uh, we do not really consider monitored as a, as a definitive treatment for uh, somebody who is having an acute epidural hematoma or other uh, surgical conditions. So the, the answer is A and B. Okay, thank you, doctor. The final question reads, which one is an indication for surgical treatment of depressed skull fracture? A, uh, closed depressed skull fractures without neurologic deficit. B, ping pong type of fracture in children. C, a compound depressed skull fracture. And D, all of the above. Dr. Sarkasa, you have the floor. So for this, any compound depressed skull fracture should be operated. But uh, for uh, closed depressed skull fracture, there is a there is a room to uh, to conservatively treat this patient without uh, surgery, especially if there is no neurologic deficit. And ping pong type of fracture, especially in uh, neonates and infants are those fractures that are, um, we, we call it green stick fractures in or like for orthopedic patients. So these, these are fractures that might, uh, through time, uh, can correct themselves as the brain grows. So they are not indication for uh, surgery. So the, in, in the indication is a compound depressed skull fracture. Yeah. All right, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Sadel, you have the floor. Thank you all very much. Uh, so uh, we'll be closing our webinar. Once again, Dr. Zagab, thank you very much. It was a very informative and engaging session. And uh, to all our participants, thank you. We're very glad to have you with us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.